Good evening and welcome to American Baptist Women's Ministries series, Let the Walls Fall Down. We are so grateful that each of you have decided to spend some time with us this evening. Whether it is your first time or it is a return visit, welcome. I am Reverend Dr. Gina Jacob Strain and I serve as the Executive Director for American Baptist Women's Ministries. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you thanking you for the opportunity to gather tonight. We thank you for each person who has taken time out of their busy schedule to come and learn from these gifted teachers. We thank you for Pamela, Elaine, and Reverend Dr. Stapleton. Please guide and use them in a mighty way as we learn how to empower seniors tonight. For in Proverbs, it tells us that our gray hair is a crown of glory and in Job that wisdom is with the aged. Lord, thank you for the gift of age. Let us treat these individuals with honor, dignity, and compassion. Lord, help us to care for our loved ones, ourselves, or simply come alongside a senior as they search for direction in this phase of their lives. Lord, you know what each of us needs to take away from this webinar tonight. Please open our hearts and minds that we will be receptive to this information and apply it to our lives. May we use this information to encourage our family, friends, and neighbors. We ask that this webinar bring you honor and glory as we are your hands and feet in this world. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. AB Women's Ministries is a Christ-centered ministry with a commitment to encourage and empower women and girls to serve God. ABWM is a diverse and intergenerational sisterhood of American Baptist women and girls serving in ministry in Christ's name in the U.S., including Puerto Rico. With local, area, region, and state, and national levels of ministry, American Baptist Women's Ministries strives to create and sustain communities of passionately faithful, mission-minded women and girls engaged in worship, service, friendship, and leadership. We are keenly focused on mission with women and girls in several key areas, such as prevention and education of domestic violence and sex trafficking, immigration, cross-cultural relationships, economic empowerment, building beloved community, developing leaders, advocacy, and UN sustainable goals. Let me just give you a few guidelines for our time together. You must be muted throughout the presentation. However, you may type your question into the question or chat box on your control panel. Lastly, but certainly not least, Please complete the survey so that we may continue to provide outstanding webinars and that we may take your feedback into consideration as we plan. We hope to see you at our upcoming events. Our next webinar is Identifying and Managing Bullying Behavior, which will be held on March 3rd at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Our guest presenter is Dana Jones, who is a counselor at Defining Moments. Celebrate the accomplishments of women by joining us for our Women's History Month gatherings, Mondays in March, from 12.30 to 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. We hope you join us for our virtual tea celebration on Saturday, March 26th, at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. There will be a Best Tea Party Hat Contest, trivia, special music, and our guest speaker will be Reverend Lisa Harris Lee, who is the Director of Healing and Transforming Communities at American Baptist Home Mission Societies. American Baptist Women's Ministries is hosting sectional meetings for women to hear what's happening in American Baptist Women's Ministries, locally, regionally, and nationally. The Western Section meets on May 3rd, 
Midwestern section meets on May 10th, and the Eastern section meets on May 17th. We invite you to join us at our Women and Girls Conference on July 22nd through the 24th. The event will be hybrid, so you can join us virtually from your home or at American Baptist Women's Ministries headquarters in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. We have a great lineup of speakers planned. Our Friday evening preacher will be Reverend Dr. Shannon DeLay Harris. Our Saturday evening preacher will be Reverend Marsha Scipio. And our Sunday morning worship preacher will be Reverend Dr. Bernadette Glover. We hope to see you at these events. For more information and to register, visit www.abwomensministries.org events. Stay connected with American Baptist Women's Ministries. Continue visiting our website at www.abwomensministries.org. And also follow us on social media sites. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Pamela Bridgeworth began her career as a physical therapist, obtaining a BS in physical therapy from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. After working in many settings along the continuum of healthcare, her interest in disability ministry, health and wellness, and healthcare access in the church and community led to her enrollment at Union Presbyterian Seminary, where she obtained a Master of Arts in Christian Education. She utilizes these intersecting threads to see the whole person as she works with older adults and families as a care coordinator at Senior Connections, the Capital Area Agency on Aging, sharing perspectives, options, and resources. Additional roles have included being a care transition coach, chronic disease self-management, and matter of balance facilitator, and advanced care planning ambassador. Elaine Cody is a life coach who specializes in partnering with her clients to create strategies for transition. Whether it's from singleness to marry, no children to mom, working woman to retiree, or gracefully aging, life is full of transitions. Her coaching revolves around the pursuit of clarity and establishing plans to create forward movement. She supports her clients' intentions and helps them think deeply about what they want and why. Elaine believes that everyone is born to live with purpose and meaning at all stages of their lives. Elaine trained at the Institute of Life Coach Training, believing that clarity empowers you to know what to do. She completed certifications in the Clarity Method and Retirement Options to meet the specific needs of her clients. In addition, she earned a Certificate of Ministry and Theology from Princeton Theological Seminary. Reverend Dr. Deborah Leah Stapleton is associate pastor where she serves within the pastoral care department. Reverend Dr. Stapleton also serves as an on-call chaplain at RWJ Barnabas Hospital and serves as full-time chaplain with Homeside Hospice. She has a certificate of ethical endorsement as a healthcare chaplain from the American Baptist Churches USA. She completed four units of the clinical pastoral education CPE at RWJ Barnabas Hospital, accredited by the Association of Clinical Pastoral Education. Reverend Stapleton has a certificate of completion for palliative care chaplaincy specialty from the California State University Institute for Palliative Care in partnership with Healthcare Chaplaincy Network. She has a clinical certificate in both basic and advanced bow and family system theories and bow and family system theories as a faith leader. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you to Deborah, Pamela, and Elaine, our panelists. We are going to get right into the questions now that you have heard these wonderful introductions of our sisters that have come tonight to share with us uh, from their information, from the knowledge that they have and the wisdom that they have uh, as we shed some light on ways in which we can support our seniors. So the first question 
uh, is a three part question and each person has three minutes uh, to answer this question. And we're going to start with Pamela, uh, which means the other two of you get a chance to think about it a little bit. Um, but it means that the next question I'll be coming to one of you first. So the three parter is, what emotional, spiritual, physical needs of seniors uh, pre-COVID and during COVID have you noted? And these are all kind of related. Um, how have you seen seniors be connected or disconnected from the local church? Um, and then the last part of it is what tips can you share on how to take or create or how to take care of seniors in a COVID environment? So first, let's just talk about the emotional, spiritual and physical needs of seniors if you can compare them pre-COVID and during COVID? Um, the physical needs uh, existed before COVID, financial needs, inadequate housing, home repairs. Um, some people were unable to prepare nutritious food. Our caregivers were stressed. There were lack of staff to help people at home. All of those things were present before the pandemic and were exacerbated during the pandemic, of course, and more. Mm. Some of the emotional needs of seniors are the same as everyone, since a need for love and belonging, safety, sense of self-esteem. And for many people who were able to meet those through the gathered church, um, the church offered a sense of belonging, those social interactions, uh, um, all the senses were involved, sight, seeing one another, hearing, music, touch, reaching out to others, taste, even communion, smell, even of flowers or um, perfumes of mm. other people. The pandemic caused um, some isolation, boredom, some of those emotions, um, feeling out of the loop, fear, frustration, things were a lot slower. And it may have been the first time some of us had some of the experience that people could not gather at the church before. So that was one thing that existed before. There were homebound people before, people who had disabilities before, who had already experienced some of those isolating experiences or lack of visibility of others that we got to experience being confined the first time. Um, people have connected by, um, electronics by uh, technology, conference calls for a Bible study, Sunday school, Zoom, Zoom church meetings, electronic giving, mailing. And it provides some new opportunities for people, depending on your church, how technologically advanced you were. It was new for our church. So some people who uh, had been homebound were out of the loop unless someone came to visit them. So it did provide mm -hmm for people to participate in a conference call, Sunday school, uh, see the services in Zoom and feel a part of. So, um, but the disconnection part um, is that a lot of people lack technology. Uh, they could not afford it. They didn't have smartphones. They didn't have, mm -hmm. they didn't know how to do those things. And didn't have anyone to teach them how to do it. And, can, I, can you pause here and just give a couple of tips uh, yes. that you found to be helpful um, on how to take care of seniors in this sort of persistent COVID environment that we're in? I would say um, that those things indicated that we need to be inclusive and use all means. Um, even though we've moved to our technology, there are people who um, are using other means. So as part of the church, not to leave people out to still call, use letters, other things that can connect them. It's important to them to be reached out to, um, share COVID information, like home vaccination, do things that are practical. Um, for birthday celebrations, there are video um, greetings that you can do to connect people. I had one recently with someone who was 90 years old. They had a small practical uh, personal gathering but people could do a video uh, sharing as well to broaden. Awesome. And uh, the last thing um, is for us to make connections with a broader uh, range of persons. 
um, to broaden our support groups and make connections with people of all ages. Uh, it was interesting, someone who wasn't as close uh, in the spiritual realm talked about uh, how we have silos. So avoiding silos, you know, the youth ministry, the women's Bible class, the men's Bible class, have, have friends of all ranges, all ages, and all cultures. Um, those are more opportunities for connection and for support. And so I I'm gonna ask you to pause there. And, and, and Deborah, from a chaplain's perspective, can you share with us similarly what you may have seen in some of the emotional, spiritual, uh, physical needs of, of seniors and how that might have changed COVID versus not COVID, and then some tips that you might have on, on how to uh, care for seniors in this, in this pandemic. I was smiling during Pamela's presentation because it was um, so all-inclusive. I'm like, okay, now what can I say? <laughs> but, but I do know that I wanna um, hone in on the loneliness that even before COVID-19 um, and, and during COVID-19, loneliness, well, during COVID-19, loneliness was exacerbated, but it was, but there was loneliness before COVID-19. And, and seniors, seniors, I think, desire more so than, and, and, and just like young children, desire the physical touch um, and before COVID-19 and, and during COVID-19, the human touch, uh, but during COVID-19, the human touch almost became, it became impossible. So that the, the loneliness um, really created a different kind of physical and emotional harm, I think, to, to seniors. Um, spiritually, seniors wanted to be in church because in church there was uh, fellowship, there was touch. As, as Pamela talked about, there was the sight, there was the hearing, all of the senses, the feeling, all of the senses were in play and, 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 and they could use their voices. They could shout amen or, or clap their hands or, or do things to, to just uh, show the 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 coming of the spirit within them, and 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 when the buildings closed, seniors felt a sense of um, of loss and grief, and, and we don't talk about that. But grief is grief is something in loss and bereavement happen and it's not just about death it, but it is really about the loneliness and the feeling of emptiness um and, and funerals i think um that was something else that was especially hard has been hard during covid um well, especially on seniors because because many seniors uh recognize that they're dying however um and, and just like all of us recognize that we are dying except that um we don't want to die alone. And, and seniors were dying alone. Right. And, and there was this loneliness. There was this, uh, you couldn't be in the room with the, the senior. You couldn't be in the place with the senior. And so uh, there was an, o an overwhelming number of deaths of, of seniors in a very short period of time. And, and only the person in the room was a nurse's aide. And so, so spouses who had been together for years, 70 years, 60 years, 50 years, 30 years, whatever it was, they, they had to, to not be present present and not be able to say goodbye. And so that closure, mm -hmm. that was something that was really, really important. Um, I remember once that um, a, a senior asked me to remove my mask and um, I had to say no. And, and it hurt me to say no, but I couldn't say yes. They wanted to see the smile on my face. And I said, you have to look at my eyes and see my see the smile and feel the smile and and some bodies remember some of some some of the the people who had died were warehoused and and how we we ex had to accept that as part of um who we were at the time and and and, and funerals weren't we couldn't say oh we're going to have a funeral in three days it was whenever the funeral director could could kind of squeeze you in and so so that whole process change. We couldn't take food to our house. We had to leave it on the doorstep. We couldn't give hugs. We couldn't give kisses. So so that was something that was really hard. Um, in terms of the connection and disconnection to the church, I think that the connection was that we learned to stream. Seniors had to learn to stream online. They had, and, and, and they could give, and connecting uh, seniors could, in fact, volunteer. They could volunteer volunteer to give out meals, they could volunteer to, to give out clothing, they could volunteer to give out food, they could volunteer as tutors, and tutoring was online. Um, they could volunteer to read to, to, 
to children or to other adults. So that kind of kept them connected. So that the whole process of, of being on Zoom, like Pamela talked about, that was something that was really, that was really important. Um, they had to use masks. And so that whole thing of even going to the store, somebody talked to me about, oh, wow, I might have been Elaine. <laughs> we, we talked about uh, being able to go to the store early, but you had to wear a mask. You had to cover up. You didn't know who, who, was, in, who was in the room. The disconnection was staying at home alone. Right. Right, and right. not being able to have that sense of of being together, and um, some of the tips I would just say that I would suggest in terms of taking care of seniors um, to share uh, just very quickly. I would say call seniors, call, call, call. Teach them how to use Zoom. Teach them how to use their smartphones if they have them. Teach them how to FaceTime. Um, I was with a patient. And in the hospital, and she was so upset because she couldn't see her sons. And I said, do you FaceTime? What kind of phone do you have? She had an iPhone. So I showed her how to use FaceTime. And she was like so excited. She's like, oh, I can see him. I can see him. I said, it's almost like they're in the room with you. So so that's something that's important. And, and teach them how to, to share photographs. There are little things that we can do with seniors that we can do online that is so, so important. And also encourage seniors to get outside and move, to exercise, and, and not to let television become the thing. I, I wrote a quote down that um, uh, Gil Scott Heron used to sing this song, the revolution will not be televised. And so I say, seniors, <laughs> your life will not be televised. <laughs> so, so just know that. That's so, so important. And if you watch TV as a senior, then make sure that you do something. Maybe watch a dance class and dance. Maybe watch a, 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 a music video and sing. <laughs> but do something more than... And, and you can also start a class on YouTube. Learn how to use it. Start a blog and and also attend the webinars <laughs> that <laughs> the Women's Ministry is having. Um, but do some things that are exciting because that's what's so important so that you can connect because as seniors, connection and interaction, socialization is the key. Thank you. Uh, Elaine, what would you like to add to, to this before we move on to question two? And I'm going to give you a little less time, sorry, um, a little less time, probably about two minutes uh, to, to add whatever you would like to add to this. Well, thank you. Um, I think the thing I'd like to add is my it, most recent experiences were with my mother-in-law and she was in uh, assistant living. And the thing that I noticed about the seniors was a, a sense of confusion. So it really is important to answer people's questions or if they have that look of a question on your face that you uh, phrase a question for them and then give them answers mm -hmm. because in an assistant living facility, there are a lot of people coming and going. They're nurses, they're aides, there's time for meals. So they have a schedule during the day. So when COVID started, all of these people now have masks on. And so if your memory wasn't good before, it was being taxed because these masked people kept coming into your space. You didn't remember who left. You didn't know who came in. And no one expected uh, anyone to be able to remember these things or to ask a question every time of, of who that was. And so we found what the, we would do is that we would answer, we would answer um, my mother-in-law's questions uh, and try to dispel that confusion because that confusion leads to fear. And it was a very fearful time, not like with COVID now where it's kind of in place and we kind of know what to do. And the other part is uh, if somebody does have uh, technology, get one of the staff in the facilities we enlisted a, a young woman who had an, an iPhone and she said she would be happy to FaceTime at a certain hour. So we knew to be in place and to be available. And so at that hour, she would boot us up on FaceTime and we could be in the presence of our mother. And it made such a big difference. And she was so grateful. That's so helpful. I mean, everything that each of you has said, but I had not thought about 
Um, Pamela, you gave us a really broad scope to think about, but also each of you have added something different. And it's each of these components are, are essential because there's so many different things that we encounter in trying to care for seniors, which is one of the reasons why we have a panel tonight. Um, and, and, I, and I know, Elaine, what you're saying is because I recently visited um, my aunt to take her to the doctor and I had on a hat, I had on glasses and I had on a mask. And when I got to her door, she said, who are you? And then I took my mask down because I wanted I you know, wanted her to see my face. And she goes, oh, Gina, it's you. But she didn't recognize me because I realized I was so covered. Um, and at first it took me aback a little bit. I was like, what do you mean, who am I? But I realized that because I was so covered, uh, that puzzled look on her face was exactly what was there, that look of confusion. Uh, so now we're gonna move on to, our, to the next question. And um, uh, Deborah will ask you to go first. Um, and we'll ask you each to take about a minute or so to this. It says, what are some senior self-care tips that you can suggest? Ways in which uh, seniors can take good care of themselves. And we'll start with Deborah. Deborah, you're, 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 you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> In between, we're supposed to mute, so I'm like, okay, <laughs> but okay. So one of the things I thought about very, very quickly was socialization. As seniors, I would just say uh, the the biggest tip for me would be volunteer, exercise, and exercise could mean just walking, walking around the block, walking around the house, walking somewhere. I, I say kind of outside. I know it's been cold, but even if you just just walk in front of the house or in front of your apartment or in front of whatever, you, you know, walk to the bus stop, walk back or walk just a few minutes and then walk back. But just and try to partner with somebody um, who is not necessarily your spouse or your significant other and, and share some fun activities. Um, and if you can travel, travel. And, and, and it doesn't have to be expensive travel, but try to travel and see a part of the world that you haven't seen before or see a part of the state that you haven't seen before or see a part of the city that you haven't seen before or see a part of the neighborhood that you haven't seen before because travel doesn't always have to be outside. And then the last thing I would say is to write down ideas that you dreamt about to journal, to write down some ideas, and now try to take some time to discover them. So if you write down, oh, I would just, I've always wanted to paint. Okay, get some, some crayons, or get some colored pencils, or get some paint, and just do it. If you say, I want to dance, dance. If you, Whatever it is that you dreamt about that you wanted to discover, discover it in yourself. Because self-discovery, and self-care, and I'll talk about that at other in another question, but, but self-care is important and taking the time to just really rediscover who you are as a senior. That's important, really important. Elaine, would you add to that? I would, I liked uh, Deborah's comment about volunteering. There is a website called Volunteer Match and it does just that. It matches a volunteer to a nonprofit and so if you have a particular interest, you can plug that in. So I have a sister-in-law who's a, a senior and uh, she's relatively confined because of an illness. And she uses Volunteer Match to find um, an organization that made stuffed animals for families who had lost a, a family member. <laughs> the organization would provide a t-shirt, a robe, or something that belonged to the person who passed away. And she would turn it into a monkey, an elephant, whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's within her wheelhouse of skills, but it was so meaningful because she knew that she was one, using her skills and also using her skills to do something nice for somebody else, which always feels really good. And then the other thing is that when people begin to discover something that they want to do, there are a world of teachers on YouTube. And I highly suggest that uh, if the person has the ability to get onto YouTube, you can learn to paint, you can learn to dance, you can learn 
what not to do when you exercise. You can learn what to do and you, you can use your computer that way. Uh, if you are in a facility like an assistant living or um, longer term care, they usually have classes. And um, at some point, uh, people have been able to come out. They have to wear their masks, of course, but it gives them a chance to participate in an activity and socialize with people that they know. I was just visiting someone uh, in an assisted, in a care facility, in a rehab facility. And I had to walk through seniors playing with a beach ball uh, to get in order to get to the room that I was going to, it was, I was not anticipating that I would be dodging a big, huge beach ball, but that is an example. And they did have one mask and they were socially distanced, um, but how much fun one can have with a beach ball, not at the beach. So that, that was uh, something that they were doing. Pamela, can you add something to, to that question as well? Self-care for seniors? Yes, I took mine kind of for caregivers, um, but it still applies. First thing is to give yourself permission. Uh, Self-care is not selfish. And sometimes as Christians, we think about scriptures about sacrifice and others, but there are other scriptures that talk about Christ and the prophets being ministered to. And he said, come apart and rest a while. And it says, look not only to um, person not to look to his own interests, but also to the needs of others. So it's both and uh, not just the other person. Love your neighbor as yourself. So first give yourself permission to think of yourself. Uh, caregivers often are focused so much on the needs of the other person to the exclusion that they don't even think of what uh, will sustain me or bring me joy. So it helps to think of yourself um, as a child of God, that there are two children of God uh, with needs. And that keeps it, uh, you feeling like a martyr. It also does some uh, equanim, what's the word? Um, equality, I guess, that the person you're helping, they have something to offer and needs. You have something to offer and needs. So there's some respect involved in that. Um, be willing to use formalized help. So often, even sometimes when people can afford it, they're not willing to utilize that. Don't wait until uh, you've broken down, as long as I can do it, or until it's an emergency, utilize it early. Uh, keep a list of ways if people ask you, uh, how can I help you? Keep a running list of things that could be done to help you care for the other person or some things that would be joyful to you. Maybe you need a list of things that bring you joy, keep you uplifted. I like a little coffee and donuts or bring me something from McDonald's. I need a book. Uh, think daily what brings you a little joy. Uh, try to increase your computer skills, I'd say as able. Um, there are people who feel ashamed. I mean, I know a very competent 90 year old, she lives by herself, she's single, no children. And um, she kept, kept apologizing. I'm not like, you know, she didn't have those skills and, and people should not feel bad about these things. Um, and so just gradually try to increase things, your knowledge as you're able to. We're um, gonna move on to the next set of questions. And I just wanna note a couple things that are, are in the chat. Uh, Deborah noted that if you don't have YouTube, you can find exercise and you can find anything on TV. These days, many of us have remotes that we can speak into now that you can just say what it is you want to go, but you can just surf. And there's almost, there's almost anything you can find on TV that you can find on YouTube, you can also find on TV. Um, someone else noted that, um, that for, for someone, a family member who had Alzheimer's, that COVID added to that sense of loneliness and that it was very hard for that person to understand why they couldn't see others. Uh, one of the questions, what we're gonna to move to now, and for all of you who are online, prepare that shortly we will enter into a Q&A um, opportunity where you will be able to ask questions. But our next question, and we'll start with Elaine, is what should people look for when they are looking for care or, or senior living uh, arrangements for those that they care for? What should they, keep, what should they be looking for? Uh, the first thing that I would say is pray for wisdom. 
we're in an area where there are a lot of opportunities for different kinds of care and there are different levels of care. And so you can find a place where perhaps someone could live in a cottage that's a cluster of cottages, or you may find some place where somebody has an independent apartment within a building, but within that same facility, they may have independent living, assistant living, they may have nursing home. And there's a fluidity back and forth between those different uh, areas. So I think one of the, the things about care is what does your loved one need? And not just what does your loved one need, but what does your loved one need now and perhaps later? And how does that facility handle that level of care? How does that facility price that level of care? Because bottom line is you are paying for a series of professionals at every level, maybe not an independent living, but when you get to assistant living, it is just what it says. Someone assists you, you pay for that assistance. And you are going to want to know what kind of communication do these places establish between you, the loved one, and the people, staff who are in the facility. Because sometimes uh, you would think that uh, perhaps the nurse on the floor would give you a call if something were to happen to your loved one. It is not a guarantee. So you want to establish some of those things uh, up front. And if you're not getting what you want, you should definitely tell them what it is you need. If it's not something they do, then ask them how you can get that because you never know what they have or associations that they have with other levels of service and other agencies unless you ask them. Elaine, that was very helpful. Uh, Deborah, we'll go to you and then Pamela. So I'm, I'm inclined to definitely agree with Elaine. And I also want to say that the biggest thing is to research, research, research. So that, that's just right in line with what Elaine was saying. It's wisdom, research, um, reading, going to the location, taking the time to look at the facilities that not just are near to you within driving distance, but when you're caring for a senior, look throughout the state, read about the facility because um, you need to determine is it long term is it assistant living or is it a senior community and there's a difference between the three and just know like what it is that you want um, since I've been working with homeside hospice I've come across some facilities that um, I know that I may not want to put myself in and that's the very first question that I ask would yeah. I want to be here and so that to me is so important. There's one facility that I want to take my husband to because I'm like, okay, if something happens and we can't get, this is where I would like to be because it is so warm. And I, I, I looked at the staff and, and also know something about the ownership. That's yeah. something that yeah. we sometimes forget. Who owns it? Is it a franchise or is it is it a small private? Is it independently owned? Who owns it and how involved is the owner in the facility in terms of making sure that the care that is given is really important? One facility that I, I go to is family owned and Initially, the, the nurses, they didn't want to wear the mask and they were wearing them around their mouth, but not over their nose. And the state came in and was like, mm -mm, you're going to be closed down. And the owner came and said, oh, no, we're not closing down. And he just, he made some real strict rules and the rules have changed the facility because what he realized was that people were dying. They were dying because they weren't. The, the, they weren't being cared for in the right manner. And so that's really important to know to know something about, is there a board of directors and, and how involved are the residents also in the running of the facility? Is there a connection between a hospital? Is there a connection with doctors? Are there nurses coming in? Can hospice come in? If, if you want hospice, can it be private hospice or is the facility running the hospice? And so those are just some of the, the questions. And if you're taking care of a senior at home, one of the things that I would say is that it's important to know as a caregiver that you cannot do it alone. 
And no matter how you think you can, you're going to need help. And so that means another way of researching because you want to research who it is that you're going to bring into your house. Is it somebody 24 seven or is it somebody just part time? My brother-in-law needed care. He, his wife wanted him to be home. And so he was home, but my brother-in-law needed care. And she thought at first she could do it by herself. And then she realized she couldn't. She needed somebody to help get him out of the bed to go to the bathroom to clean him up. And so she had, she had somebody come in. They were coming in during the day. But at night, she was by herself. And that was really a painful experience for her. And so then we had to get somebody 24 seven. So they could somebody in the day and then somebody at night. But that is something that is so important. And remember in it all, I think Pamela talked about self care. As a caregiver, you have to take care of yourself. Because what I have seen in my role as a chaplain is that sometimes caregivers die before the patient they're caring for because they forgot that they needed self-care. Yeah. You have to put your own so oxygen mask on first before yeah. you can. And, and the Bible teaches us that we have to love our, love our neighbors and our neighbors can be family. Love our neighbors as ourself, which means that we have to love ourselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. Pamela, would you round out this? And then we're going to, I'm just going to ask you to spend a minute or so on this question. And I'm going to be sort of strict about that minute. Um, and then we are, we are going to open it up for questions, open it up for Q&A. So go okay. ahead, Pamela. Um, I work with community care. So some of the factors to consider when selecting what type of care are the diagnoses of the person. So that's mm -hmm diagnosis, their abilities, as well as their mobility, the home architecture, the cost, whether you're going to use informal or agency persons, what are your resources for paying for it? And I'll have to talk about that more. Uh, the individual, don't lose sight of the person themselves, the convenience for you and your health, and which location are you going to get care in, which we've talked about some of the options besides home. When you're looking or considering a home care agency to help you with personal care, bathing, dressing, toileting, uh, be sure that you specify what you want the person to do. People say, I need someone to sit with them. I need some help. Uh, specify what activities you need. And there are different price points for bathing, dressing, or personal care, and sitting with people. Consider which days and hours will help you the most. And if they have minimum required hours, if there's 24-hour coverage, if there's backup coverage, um, ask for questions about COVID concerns. Sometimes that's a barrier for people mm -hmm. who need help, but they won't because they don't know, but they don't ask. How do they select staff about their billing and how frequently and who you can talk to if you have complaints. So those are some considerations when you're selecting a home care agency. You know? yeah, those are all really, really critical. And I think if anyone has gone through the process of selecting, I think you never feel 100% that you've made the best choice or the right choice. But I think also give yourself some grace that you've made the best choice that you can um, and that things can be changed, that you, that you absolutely can make a change. Um, uh, my husband and I are caregivers for three seniors, uh, two that live with us and one that does not. Um, but we happen to be, uh, for two that don't have children, we are part of their caregiving um, resources, if you will. And so, uh, the thing about self-care is also really, really uh, important because you can't take good care of them if you have not taken good care of yourself. And if you are not getting sleep, at some point you're going to be cranky and, and that's not going to be good for anybody. So we open it. Yeah. And so we open it up for Q&A. If you have any questions, um, you can add your questions by using the chat. You can also put them um, in the Q&A as well. Um, I think the other thing is that, um, is it, I want to say that it's Medicaid.gov that allows you to go in and look at rankings um, of home health, eight of, of nursing homes and rehab facilities, but there's nothing that beats a visit. 
uh, to be able to, to, to go in and visit. And also just the idea of what is going to be, I think Elaine said this, the ongoing dialogue mm -hmm. that you're going to be able to have with that facility about your loved one. Uh, I think that is, that is really um, an essential part of it. Um, do we have some questions? Yeah. There are some questions, but just one of the things I want to add to that is that when you, you can't just leave the, you can't just put the patient in and then leave them. You have to get to know who's can, who, who in that facility is interacting with your loved one so that they know that you are going to be around because that makes a big difference with my mom, my, my mother and my great aunt that I had to, that I, we, had to put my great aunt has Alzheimer's and we put her in a facility, but I got to know the nurses and the aides and the, the custodians and everybody in the facility. And I was like, I didn't have a problem trying to get to know the executive director and the director of nursing. So, so just know that it's important that people know who, who is, who is there and who's helping your loved one. Um, a, a piece of advice that a doctor recently gave our family was that rehab can be selective. And what I mean by that is that if you have a senior who maybe has a terminal illness um, and is in a facility for rehab, if they get short staffed, they may decide, you know what? Maybe they don't get the rehab today. And so that idea of being present, popping in, dropping in, mm -hmm. um, being there, makes it makes the facility also know uh, that you are going to you're going to be there you need to know who the physical therapist is you need to know what the time is because they some places and this is how you can tell whether you're in a good place or not may come and visit a senior while they're having breakfast and then the senior may say come back and they'll say the senior refused physical therapy for that day now this is a doctor's advice to us and so it won't be that the senior refused it, is that the senior in, in saying, can you come back, didn't realize that that was refusing it. And that is what they put in the chart and they don't come back. So that idea of being present and checking in and dropping in uh, is, is very, very important. Pamela, I think you said you wanted to say a little bit more about cost. Um, and, and let's see, and we have a question, that, a question up. About that It says, what do you do when the senior refuses to realize <laughs> she needs to leave her home and move to assisted living? <laughs> I think we're all familiar with this question. Okay. Uh, what can we do to convince her that she needs more care? Um, and it says her doctor has told her she is not safe in her own home, but she still refuses to come to that realization. So what would you say, Pamela? Uh, that that you that you ways in which of encouraging someone that they need additional support. Well, I think you might explore something other than assisted living. I mean, that's a big move. You might acknowledge that it's a big move. Uh, you could take someone to visit. Most of the time, people are not familiar with uh, all of the options for care. So that kind. Mm -hmm. Assisted living may be very vague. What does it entail? So a visit could be a possibility. Um, seeing if that person could start with receiving some care at home, maybe suggest just starting with receiving some care. Sometimes people suggest that, but really assisted living is very expensive. It's at least three or $4,000 a month. So everyone, even though that level of care can be, it can be good, Many people would benefit from it, but are not able to afford it. So sometimes people suggest it, and it's not even really a, you know, in the realm of possibility. It's helpful. Some persons can have some assistance through veterans benefits and other things. But I'm saying as far as willingness, uh, maybe if you would start with something a little bit less invasive or you know, start her getting used to accepting some help um, or ask some of her concerns about it uh, as far as even having someone to start to provide some help. And then if, I mean, if it's really dangerous, then it's possible that you could, you know, get adult protective services, but probably you're seeing something and it looks like it's going to fall in the future. And so sometimes you can make some, some intervention early. And sometimes if you really just can't, sometimes it has to get to the worst thing, but it sounds like there are some opportunities for 
something a little to introduce some kind of care and introduction to what assisted living is and ask the person's concern. Sometimes it is about lo losing the, about their home. Sometimes it's about leaving. Mm -hmm. Pamela, one of the things people. that Kristen noted in that question is that the person does not have a bathroom on the main level and that going up and down stairs um, is very difficult. And so that staying in the home uh, is, is not an option. And you may have to ask you know, your doctor to, to, to take a more uh, um, heavy handed approach in terms of even talking with them about the risk. Uh, of, of being in that, in that, in that scenario. I, I'm going to move on to the next question. The next question okay. says, um, my mom is 89 years old and she is not a real people person. She's not a Zoom person, nor does she like working smartphones. Um, she is very receptive for her family and close friends. And now that uh, they feel as though COVID is coming to an end, what can they do uh, to help her get her business in order. And I'm not sure what you mean by that. Do you mean uh, in terms of getting care or getting a will? Um, so if you, so I think, but getting, you know, how can they nudge her uh, to help her in that, in that way of getting her business in order? I, I, I will just say that I um, had a family relative who had never done a, a will. And what she said to me was that you'll know what to do. And I said to her, I will not know what to do unless you tell me what to do. So unless you just want a mess, you better tell me what to do. And that encouraged her <laughs> to get a uh, will. I well, think that that's an important, <laughs> an important thing. So Deborah, why don't you take a stab at this question? <laughs> I, I, I'm laughing because it's like, wow. <laughs> but what, I mean, you have to be kind, you have to be gentle with the person. Because remember, um, change is hard. It is not something that is easy. It's not easy for us. You know, I'm a senior. It's not easy. <laughs> um, and and I, I, but but one of the things that may do is you may want to draft something, um, th and then just go over it with them and say, "Would you want me to have this, or or would you want this to go to?" So you know, to try to get them to begin to think that it's okay to plan. Um, I've been working with, um, it, especially in hospice, uh, trying to get individuals to, to just think of funeral directors because in hospice, there is, the, the death is, is, is more imminent than, than, than even when we, you know, those of us who are out there um, live in a well, we don't think about it. Uh, as imminent, but it every it's, it's for all of us and, and the planning, the pre-planning. And so when I talk to to people about, uh, not even so much to the seniors, but to the families, is that when you pre-plan, it helps to make a difference. Uh, my mother, I, with my mother, she and I sat down and we talked about it. What, what would you like to wear? What would you want to wear? What, you know, what kind of casket would you want? And then we kind of made it into a fun live activity so that, but I was still very gentle with her about it because it's something that is so important, but you do want to have a, con try to have a conversation about it. And, um, and just the expense of it, that when you're emotional, you can get taken. And that's not something that we, we talk about. And so when I talk to, sometimes I talk to families and I say, when you're, in, when you're not emotional, you make rational decisions. When you're emotional, you make decisions of the heart and yeah. not the that's head. Very, that's and so that's uh, something that so you really want to think about. Someone also noted in the chat that you should partner with a social worker and a care manager. Also mm -hmm. attorneys who... Um, and ultimately, this was a very helpful tool for our family. Attorneys who prepare wills mm -hmm. often have a questionnaire that you can walk through with a family member to help them think about certain things. So it's not even something that you may have to generate on your own. And I'm sure you could Google it and Google probably has a form that, but you, you, but you, has everything that, you, can, that you can, you know, that you can fill out also. So you don't have to pay an attorney. You can right, Google. Right. You can Google. That's what I'm saying. But yeah. also both and. So that because there, there are things that you just might not naturally think of, but there are forms and things that will guide you through a discussion. Elaine, it looks like you want to add something. Yeah, I wanted to add that there are a group of women who are not lawyers uh, who offer 
a package called Good to Go, like Ooh. I'm Good to Go. And it is a series of sheets that has all the questions that probably a lawyer is going to ask you, the concerns that you're probably going to have. And it, it's, it's also a great conversation starter. If you choose to hire um, one of the women as, as a coach to help you go through it, well, so be it. If not, you can buy the package. It can be at home. It can be private and you can use it any way that you want, but it's a good um, springboard for conversations. That awesome resource. It is. And awesome also, resource. And chaplains can, besides social workers, chaplains can often help as well because sometimes the, the spiritual side may be helpful in getting the person to see that it's not just about you're trying to move them to do something, but that, that the chaplain can talk about faith over fear. And they can talk, you know, from from different biblical scriptures or depending on what the, the person's uh, relationship with God is and to, to talk through how important it is to um, to keep moving forward and trust. It is 859 and we try to wrap up uh, as, as close to this time as, as possible. So, Pamela, I'm going to let you have the closing words. Um, and then um, the conversation project also has good questions to help people say what is important uh, to them at the end of life. So Pamela, would you like to wrap it up uh, with some closing comments here? Um, there's something called advanced care planning and there's a website, honoring choices. And so one thing good to do is to do it yourself. So it doesn't look like it's all about death. It is something mm. all adults should be doing. We should all have our powers of attorney. Uh, we should talk about things early on when there's no issue. And then other times you don't want to wait until it's at a, a critical point. So advanced care planners can talk and have those discussions. Uh, there are elder law attorneys who can help you with documents, but the conversation is real important. So advanced care planners have facilitators that can ask some of those questions that we're discussing. And uh, you can modify the home as well and look at architectural mm -hmm. uh, and other things like that. So it's in individualized. And oh, so the final thing I want to say is there are area agencies on aging. Uh, so you can look at uh, elder locator and then you find the area agency on aging that serves you. And then there are a range of services that can mm -hmm. be individualized. Uh, work with you and your particular situation. So eldercare.gov. Uh, Thank you. Well, um, so we're getting a lot of positive feedback uh, in the chat. This is a topic that requires um, a lot of, of, of dialogue and, and, and we could go on and on for many hours about this because there's so much information, but I hope tonight that you at least have received some information. Our panelists will have some summary points that we will post, uh, and then there will be other resources that we will share. So we are really, we thank each of you tonight for joining us. We thank all of the panelists for being here with us this evening and for sharing not only their personal experience, but also sharing their professional expertise in this area uh, so that we can be, uh, one, have good self-care, but also that we can provide the best care uh, that we possibly can for our seniors and also just to let them have a life with dignity. So uh, so we are really, really grateful for everyone that is here. Wendy, we're going to turn it back over to you. Um, so I guess we're turning it back over to me for a second anyway. Um, I want to again thank everybody for being here tonight and to ask you to consider supporting ABWM. If this or any of our free webinars have been helpful to you, know that it is your donations it is your contributions that make a difference and allow us to engage experts such as the three women who are on this panel tonight. Uh, you can give by Venmo at AB Women's Ministries. You can give by text, text uh, ABWM to 44321. You can give online at www.abwomensministries.org slash give. You can also send us a check to our headquarters at 1075 First Avenue, Suite C210, King of Prussia, one nine four oh six. 
please know that it is not only that your donations help to provide free webinars, but they also provide scholarships for when we have events for AB Girls, Young Adult Women's Ministries, as well as any of our upcoming conferences. We try to always make space for anyone who wants to be part of ABWM. And so your contributions certainly help with that. Let us pray. Good, loving, and caring God, we thank you for the information shared by our presenters tonight. We thank you for their insights and recommendations. We thank you for their wisdom gained through experience. And we pray that it will encourage us to take important steps of care for ourselves and for the seniors in our lives. God, we pray for acceptance of our changing life situations as we age and for the wisdom to make good choices that enhance both our physical health and our spiritual health. We pray that we might share our faith and trust in you to encourage others in their life's journeys and in difficult decisions. Bless now our efforts to be faithful in sharing your love and care with others, no matter who they are, always. In the name of Jesus, teacher, healer, and savior, we pray. Amen.